Good morning, everybody. Are you enjoying your extra hour this morning? Wow. I woke up this morning, my alarm went off, and the sun was up. Wow. Uh, Today, we are beginning a new series called Harvest. Harvest uh, is a series where we're going to talk about what you would expect to talk about, sowing and reaping. And next week, we are going to be talking about our generosity project that comes at the end of each year. And I am so excited about this generosity project this year because it is something that is absolutely unique to our church. It's something that we can do that no other church that I know of can do. Because I'm just going to I'm going to give you a little hint because we have Ray, the guy that was just up here, because we have Ray, and uh, and so I'm I'm so excited about what we're going to do. So be here. Make sure that you're here next week. Don't just come this Sunday and say, "Well, I came this Sunday, so I've I've done my month's worth of." of Sundays, so I'm going to stay home next. Don't do that. Don't do that. Come back next week because we are going to uh, reveal our generosity project for this year. And uh, this week, we are going to go back to basics. You know, uh, I was listening to uh, a book uh, by C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite books, uh, Mere Christianity, and how many of you have ever read Mere Christianity? Man, if you haven't read Mere Christianity, you should, you should make it a point. Either read it or listen to it. Mere, M-E-R-E, is that right? Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Read that book. It is fascinating um, to hear him talk about how God reveals himself in our lives and just Everyday conversation, how you can see that God is real and he is alive and he exists and that he is the God of Christianity. It's a great book. But anyway, I was listening to that book this week and he was talking about the great philosophers. Uh, When they talk about morality, the best ones don't try to introduce anything new. They just remind you in their own unique way of things that you already know. And so that's what we're going to do today. We're going to go back to the elementary things because I I believe, and I just felt very strongly about this this week as I was praying, uh, actually over the past couple of weeks, and thinking about this first week, what we need to do, I think we need to go back to the very foundation of Christianity, and we need to talk about what it means to be a Christian. So today's message is titled, How to Be a Christian, How to Be a Christian. In the scripture, um, Christian means that you are a follower of Christ. Christian means that you are a follower of Christ. And there are two things that you need to know about being a Christian. Really, just two main things that you need to know. And that is that to be a Christian, you believe and you follow. You believe and you follow. So let's talk about believe. Believe. Jesus said, he said, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you, be, if you declare with your mouth, I'm sorry, this is, this is Paul. Paul says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he said, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. So it's a, it's a heart, and it's a mouth, and it's a head thing It is something that gets into you and it influences everything that you think. It influences everything that you say. It influences everything that you think. So it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Jesus said, 
He said, unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, you will die in your sins. If you neglect to believe that I am who I say I am, Jesus said, you will die in your sins. The scripture says that the wages of sin is death. The payment of of sin is death. And Jesus is our only way out of that. And so he says, unless you believe that I am who I claim to be, who, who did he claim to be? Son of God, Messiah. And there's another scripture I want to share with you. This is John 8, 24. In John 7, 38, he says, Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. Do you know, do you know what he meant when he said, Believe in me as the scriptures say. What was he he talking about? They didn't have the New Testament when Jesus was talking. He was talking about the Old Testament. The Old Testament says some amazing things about the Messiah. I always like to to use this one out out of Isaiah, the prophet. When he said... uh. When he was prophesying, he was prophesying about the Messiah. We always quote this one at Christmas time. We say, he is the wonderful counselor. We don't even think about this whenever we, we don't even think about this scripture when we quote it at Christmas time. But think about it. He is the wonderful counselor. Mighty God. Prince of Of peace, everlasting Father. Wow. Jesus was saying, unless you believe in me the way the scripture has described me, he said, you cannot be saved. But whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. I remember when I when I first became a Christian. Many, many years ago, I guess I was talking to some friends of mine yesterday that were friends of mine back during that time when I was at Middle Tennessee State in college. And uh, we were talking about, I said, it's been 20 years. And she said, no, (laughs) no, it's been longer than that. And I think she said it's been like 30 years. But anyway, uh, when, when I would go to the cafeteria, I was so full of this Jesus. I was so full of the Spirit of God. I was, I, was, I was so full of Scripture because I was reading the Scripture night and day. You know, that was, that was what I did. When I, when I came back from class, I would either go to the Stones River Battlefield and walk and pray, or I would get out my Bible and read my Bible, and so I was just full all the time. And, and, and so when Jesus talks about rivers of living water flowing, flowing out of you, I understand this. I understand that the more time you spend with Jesus, the more time you spend with Scripture, the more of that that you get into you, it begins to overflow out of you. And I remember being at the table after, after lunch, and talking to a few people, and, and you know, 30 minutes would turn into an hour, and an hour into two hours, and, and then the people there at the cafeteria were like, get out, get out. It's time, to, t- time for us to get ready for supper. So if you believe in me, as the scripture says, if you believe, here's the thing, if you really believe that scripture in Isaiah, if you really believe the, the, uh, the prophecies and the Psalms about about the Messiah, if you believe that Jesus is all of those things, then it changes your life. It absolutely just changes who you are. It changes how you think. It changes your words. It changes what you do. It's important. Believe as the scripture has said. And then follow. Let's talk about follow. What it means to follow Jesus, what it means to follow Christ. This comes out of Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. 
The first thing I want to tell you about this scripture is that there is a self in you. And there's a self in me that needs to be denied. There is a part of you that needs to be denied. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Must take up their cross. What does a cross symbolize? Symbolizes the body of Christ. It's where the body of the literal body of Christ hung on the cross. It was shaped like Jesus was shaped, right? It is the body of Christ. It's who we are alone and it's who we are together. We are the body of Christ. Paul said, the Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's saying something. He had denied himself to the point and had, had received the spirit of Christ into him to the point where he could say, I bear in my body the marks. You know what the marks are? The marks of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what the marks symbolize? The marks symbolize the sacrifice. Paul sacrificed. Paul, he knew what it was like to deny himself and take up his cross and follow Jesus. So Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, I want to give you a couple of definitions. Disciple, the biblical definition means student, pupil, or apprentice. I love the word apprentice. I wish I had one of those screens like they have on the news where I could just go like that and just circle that. One day, one day we'll get that, okay? Because that's what Jesus would want. He would want me to have one of those screens where I could just do that. But I really love this word, apprentice. Disciple, the biblical definition, it talks about being a student or a pupil or an apprentice. You know what I love about apprentices? Apprentices don't just sit and take notes. Some of us want Christianity to be, Christianity to be all about being a student or a pupil. Because all we want to do is just sit and take notes. But I don't see anybody taking notes today, so I know that none of you are like that. That you just want to sit and take notes. You want to, you want to, you want to hear and you want to do. The thing I love about being an apprentice is that you watch the way somebody does something and then you copy it. You do it the way they do it. And then they say, okay, that was good, but it wasn't quite right. You need to do it this way. Think of it more this way. So whenever you're engaged in relationships as a disciple of Christ, you know, you're learning how to do relationships the way Jesus would. And, and so you may be doing your relationship with your spouse or with your friend or with a family member. And you may be doing it the way you think that Jesus wants it to be done. And then he corrects you and he says, okay, well, that was, that was, good. That was a good first try. That was a good first try. But let's try it more this way. Instead of, instead of forgiving them for just part of what they did and reminding them of the rest, let's try forgiving them of the whole thing. Nobody is with me this morning. Are you, are you with me? Okay. So, so, so he, he, he will correct you. And you, as, as an apprentice, you're not worried about correction. You want correction because you want to get better. You want to become more like Jesus. That's what an apprentice is. Years ago when I started my construction business, uh, when Lene and I, it was before Lene and I ever got married, I would hire these guys that didn't know anything. And that was the kind of person that I wanted working for me. Somebody who knew nothing when they started. And that I could teach them everything to do the way I wanted it done. And then 
So, so first I would teach them how to read their tape measure, and then I would teach them how to use the saw, and then I would teach them how to read a set of plans, and I would teach them how I, how I wanted the job done. And, and those are the only kind of guys that I hired. And then whenever they learned everything that I knew, they would go off and start their own business. That's the way that works. All right. Apprentice. Great word. Okay, but I also looked it up in Webster, and Webster's definition is this, one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of another. I love that definition. A, a, a disciple is one, a disciple of Christ is one who accepts, accepts. We accept it, right? We accept it. We take it in. We own it. It's ours. We accept it, and then we assist in spreading the doctrines of of Christ. We accept what he gives us and then we go about spreading it to other people. And you know how the gospel is spread? One heart to another. One to one. That's mainly how it happens. So Jesus said this. He said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. We follow we don't just believe, we follow. It's not about believing or following. And listen, you know people as well as I do. Some people major on belief. You know, all it takes, you just have to believe, just believe, just believe, just believe. It's all about belief. And then you know some people who are all about just doing it, just works, right? Right? Works. It's all about works, it's what you do. You know, I'm going to use the, the, the uh, expression that, that I grew up with in South Alabama, you got to do us right. You got to do us right. And, and that's the way we talked. Right, right, white, and rice. White, right, and rice. And light, light. And so uh, Jesus said, if you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. That is following Following, So it's not belief or follow. It's belief, believe and follow. We believe and we follow. Now James, the brother of Jesus, I always say this because I, I think it gives him more clout. Because sometimes we think, when we say James, we think about the disciple James, the fisherman James. It's not that James. It's Jesus' brother James. Jesus' brother, the one who looked up to his big brother Jesus. The one who apprenticed under Jesus, the one that Jesus taught how to live, how to work, how to act, how to speak. He was the default father when, when Joseph died. Jesus became the head of the family, and it was James who learned under his big brother, Jesus. And this is what James said. Now, this is what James said after watching Jesus his whole life. After watching how Jesus talked and what he did and how he acted and how he took care of his family and what he did and what he believed, this is what James said. He said, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? I could go on and I could read the whole thing. It's a whole, it's a whole chapter. He talks about Faith without works is dead, and he talks about Abraham, and he talks about, about Rahab, and he talks about all of that. And you can go read the whole chapter for yourself. Just read the whole chapter uh, 2 of James. But he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds, can such faith save him? I'm going to skip over about 10 verses here, and I'm going to go down to 24. And he says, you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Not by faith alone. He's trying to convince people you have to do something. It's, it's more than just believing. Do you have to believe? Yes, you have to believe. You have to believe so much that it becomes a part of you. It almost becomes a knowing rather than a believing. After a while, it becomes like a knowing. Like you know it like you know the sun is going to rise in the morning. So it's not, it's not works without faith and it's not faith without works. It is 
both. So believe and follow. Now, it's not an inside or outside thing. It has to be both. It's not an inside thing or an outside. It's not either or. It is both. It has to be both. So I'm going to make a statement here. If you don't have it on the inside, you don't have it on the outside. I don't, I don't think I hear enough amens out there. If you don't have it on the inside, you don't have it on the outside. You know what Jesus told the Pharisees? He said, you, well, he said a lot of things to the Pharisees. <laughs> yeah, you blood-sucking vipers. Jesus goes on this whole rant, I think it's in Matthew, that he goes on this whole rant about uh, the Pharisees. He says, you, he says, you go, you travel over over oceans and mountains to, to make one convert. And he said, and when you make them, he says, you make them twice the child of hell that you are. That doesn't sound like pastor preaching, does it? Twice the child of hell. He said, he said, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. You stand at the door, you won't go in, and you won't let anybody else go in either. But this is what he said about this. He said, you are like whitewashed sepulchers. You know what a sepulcher is? It's a tomb. You are like a whitewashed tomb. On the outside, you're pure and you're clean. But on the inside, you're full of Dead men's bones and rottenness stuff. Rottenness. Is that a word? Is that a word, Julie? So, if you don't have it on the inside, you don't have it on the outside. And dare I say it? Should I say it? You know what I'm going to say next? If you don't have it on the outside... You don't have it on the inside. That gets us. That gets to us, doesn't it? The first one was for the Pharisees, and the second one was for, is for us. If you don't have it on the outside, you don't have it on the inside. That's a tough one, y'all. It's a tough one. You know, uh, last week I talked about, you know, I always try to give you uh, some kind of helpful, practical tips, something that will help you in your life. I try to do that every week. I try to give you a challenge as much as possible. And last week I talked about conscious purity. How many of you tried the conscious purity thing this week? Anybody think about that this week? I'm glad that my sermons are so powerful <laughs> that, they, that they just really go to, straight into your heart and you apply them every week. Okay, so since you didn't do anything about it last week, I'm going to share it with you again this week. Conscious purity is when it's something I talked about at the end of the message last week. It's when you are conscious that you are committing a sin. Now, we commit all kinds of unconscious sins, right? We, we, I talked about last week, I talked about slamming my hand in my own truck door. Did you remember that? You probably remember that. You probably don't remember the rest of it. But uh, I slammed my hand in my own car door, on my own truck door a couple weeks ago. And, and I told you last week, I said, praise the Lord was not what came out of my mouth. That, that was an unconscious thing. That was an unconscious thing. And, and what, what the enemy wants to do, see, last week we were in the, the series uh, about spiritual warfare, and I was talking about the enemy a lot. So what the enemy wants to do in that situation is he wants to condemn you for your unconscious Acts, your unconscious words, your unconscious thoughts, things that just come up in your head that you're really not aware of. And, and he wants to keep you in the past on that. He wants to keep you feeling guilty for those things. And he doesn't want you to move forward. But what God wants is for you to always move forward, move forward. And, and Paul, the Apostle Paul, who is the, 
the one who persecuted Christians. And Jesus, when he met Jesus, Jesus said to him on that road that day, he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. You are persecuting me. He was torturing. He was murdering Christians. This was Paul. And Paul said, this is what I'm doing. I'm forgetting all those things that are behind and I'm pressing forward to the mark of the prize of the high calling and God of God in Christ Jesus. So, so I am with you in this. I am with you. I am trying in my life, I'm trying to open up the exterior of my life to the interior of my life. I'm trying to let the things that are on the inside, I'm trying to let those things become apparent on the exterior. You understand? God wants us to be whole Christians, not just part Christians. He doesn't want us to just be the kind of Christian who comes to church and prays and takes notes and reads their Bible and goes home and does nothing about it. No, he wants us to be real Christians. He wants us to love everybody. He wants us to really forgive, not just say, that's a, that's a great idea and I'm going to try to do that. No, he wants us to get serious about forgiveness. And I want to say this to all of you and I want to say this to all of you at home. Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother or your sister who is sending against you, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. And I want to say it to you. I don't want to say it to you. It's important that what's on the inside comes to the outside. That what's in our heart shows up in our relationships. So don't just come to church. Become the church. This is something that I heard when I was listening to a podcast this week. Don't just come to church. Become the church. We are focused, laser focused right now in our staff and on our planning team. We are laser focused right now in our church leadership about becoming the church. Becoming the church. What is 101 about when people walk in the door for the first time and you get a, you, 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 we offer, you know, 10 minute uh, Q&A after church. What is that about? It is about becoming the church. It's about getting started, becoming a part of the church. What is 101? Net 101. What is that about? It's about becoming the church. Remember, last week I talked about there is a becoming. There, you, 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 don't, just, you don't just say, I believe in Jesus and, and Bam. You're a disciple. Bam, you're an apostle. There is a becoming. There is a process. And, and, and it takes some time and it takes some effort and it takes devotion and it takes commitment. And, and, and if you are to become the best version of you, there is a becoming to that. There's a becoming to that. So don't just come to church. Become the church. Become the church. I want to share with you a scripture from uh, Acts. This is the early church. It says, so continuing daily with one accord in the temple. This is the early church. This is the, how they interacted with each other. And breaking bread from one house, from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Can you picture this? Can you picture this? It's, it's people Breaking bread in their own homes. They continued daily in one accord. They weren't, they weren't saying, well, I, I think it ought to be more like this and you think it ought to be more like that and arguing with each other. They weren't doing that, were they? No, they were in one accord. They were together. Jesus brings you together. I, I tell you, I, through, throughout my life, I met people who all they wanted to do was argue about religion, argue about Christianity, argue about denominations. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, that I believe God has used uh, the Catholic Church. I believe God has used denominations. I believe that God, you look back and you see God's hand. Who could have known? 
what he was doing when he did this and when he did that and, and how, how, how Christianity has spread from that early church to what it is today. But I, I, I'm saying this, I don't believe that division is what God had in mind. I don't believe that's what he has in mind. I believe that unity, I believe that that's what he wants more than anything else. He wants unity with us. Brothers and sisters in Christ ought not to be divided. So continuing daily with one accord in the, in the temple and breaking bread from house to house that ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. I love that. Simplicity of heart. It was simple. Jesus is our Savior. He is our provider. He is our uh, sustenance. He is the one that, that we get our life from. He is life for us and peace and joy and all of those things. And the next verse, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. See, if we will just concentrate on becoming the church, then God will add. If, if people see us in one accord, if people see us with love and kindness in our hearts, if people see us this way, the way they saw the early church, God added to them, he will add to our church, not just the net, I'm, just, I'm talking about the church in the present day. He will add those who are being saved. He will add those who are being saved. So, I just want to ask you are, you, are you, are you ready for a change in your life? Are you ready to make some changes? Are you? Well, I'm not so sure. I'm not sure, sure I want to make some changes. Are you ready to make some changes? We... You know, I started about a month ago, and uh, I started doing some things that, uh, that I've told you about. I started these habits, and I, I started just some small habits, but I do them every single day, and they make all the difference. And it was about that time that I felt like one of the things that God wanted me to do was I felt like he wanted me to every single day to study, to learn, to read, to listen, to church growth experts. Because the fact is, we have a lot of people, even since COVID. I mean, uh, before COVID, you know, this place, the, the week before uh, we had to shut down for COVID, this place was packed with with rows in the back. I don't know if you remember that. It's the largest crowd we had ever had, and we had momentum, and we were growing. And then COVID hit, and then, then we came back from COVID, and we had, I think it was eight people that first Sunday. I, I was so naive. I, I had planned a celebration. Ray's laughing. Because I had planned a celebration. We, we were going to celebrate the governor says that we can meet again. Yay! And eight people showed up. And I was shocked. And I thought, well, we gave it our best shot. It's not going to happen. Nobody's coming back. And gradually people began to come back. Gradually more and more people began to get comfortable with coming back. And... Uh, and even, we've always, we've always had a lot of people coming through the door, new people coming through the door on Sunday mornings. And, uh, and so I, I felt an obligation and I felt like what God wanted me to do was to figure out how 
we can minister to every person, every new person that comes through the door. And so I joined this group of pastors. It's called Leaderscape, and it's led by a man named Michael Murphy, who is a guy that uh, worked at Hillsong Church. I'm not sure how many years he was there, but, but uh, he was one of the major leaders in the Hillsong movement. And, and now he, he has this group called Leaderscape, and I joined this group. And he challenges us every week to grow the church. And, and it just comes down to the thing that Jesus said in the Great Commission. He said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. That's a lot of people. Make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, so he challenges, Michael Murphy ch- challenges us every week with this. You know, and, and when I had my one-on-one call a few weeks ago with uh, one of the guys that, that works for him, he challenged me. He said, he said, pastor, and he's from New Zealand, so he doesn't talk like us, but he's pastor. I wish I could do a New Zealand accent. But he said, you have a responsibility to those people who are coming in your door. You have a responsibility to them to make disciples of them. And it's not just my responsibility, but it's our, it's our responsibility. And in order to do that, we're going to have to make a few changes. It, it, you know, Sunday morning is not going to look much different. But some of you are going to need to use your, your gifts and use your, uh, give some of your time and give some of your gifts and, and volunteer and help us with the things that we're doing to help integrate people into uh, Sunday, what we do here on Sundays, and then into small groups and then into serving Teams, and let me tell you, Christianity goes way beyond that. I want to always be honest with you about that. Christianity is not just coming, giving, serving, and joining a small group. It's it's way more than that. It's all consuming. But I want you to have this Jesus that we're talking about today. I want you to have him in your life, and I want the people who come through our doors to also have that experience. Are you willing? Are you willing?